This video is sponsored by Squarespace. On March 20th, a couple days into quarantine, gamers faced a choice. Play the game about an opportunistic dick nose playing with sinful forces he does not understand, for naught but profit. Or doom. Listen, Tom Nook is a complete scoundrel, and his tax scheme is not something I have the mental energy to put up with. He'll sit there in his high-rise office building as Animal Crossing players delete worlds from existence just because the inhabitants weren't cute enough. Or a tree had some pears on it. Unlike the sinners, I actually have morals. Which is why I've decided to punish those who don't. This is what happens if you touch yourselves, kids. I'm told the icon of sin once held hands with a woman and they weren't even married yet. Well, thanks to Corona-chan, I haven't had much choice but to play Doom. The subreddit's on Reddit, and I hear the Vatican considers that a sin now too. YouTube, meanwhile, was filled with arsehats uploading Doomguy's cock reveal, so unless I wanted everything spoiled, there was nothing else to do. And you know what I learned? A single, incontrovertible truth. Violence is never the answer. It's the question. The answer's yes. Cock his shotguns and rejoice, because it's time to put the demon in demonetized. Everybody knows the best film composers. John Williams, Hans Zimmer. But does everyone know the best video game composers? I'm sure most of us could name a video game composer. I still want to know how Scott Morgan's doing down in the Shadow Realm. And Sarah Shashner has been a rising star in the industry lately. But I would say the gods, the deities with the best soundtracks and the most consistency across their projects, are Koji Kondo, who's like an elder god, Shoji Meguro, Marty O'Donnell, Michael Salvatore, Jesper Kidd, and Michael McCann. Halo, Destiny, Darksiders 2, the Ezio Trilogy, Deus Ex, these are among the greatest video game soundtracks ever composed. And the newest edition is, as we believers know, Mick Gordon for Doom. Now, a frequent gripe of mine with Doom's music is that the tracks often devolve into just noise, just metal clanking with zero composition. You could recreate it by sticking a brick in the washing machine and pushing your nan down the stairs. This still happens too often for my taste, but balancing out that minor complaint is the minor praise I have for Eternal's atmospheric music. Deep hellish chanting risks sounding obnoxious, but it works. I accidentally summoned Bloody Mary just by singing it in the shower. I knocked her out, of course, I was drinking gamer subs. But I'm trying to say, the soundscape makes hell feel more like hell than hell does. Which doesn't matter. It would in another game, but this is Doom. Admittedly, I prefer 2016 score, but when Eternal brings out an actual composition, when all is truly let loose, things become quite hard to describe. Because I'm too busy orgasming to form complete sentences, Mick Gordon is a living, breathing amplifier for your adrenaline. And with combat this good, you may just OD. So why is Doom's combat good? We all know it's brutal, we all know it gets you hyped, but why? Here's why. Doom is a select few brilliant mechanics layered on top of Iron's strong, fundamental FPS design. It displays masterful enemy design, level design, and weapon design, just like Halo. These things are fundamental. Most great FPS games have enemies like pieces on a chessboard. That's its famed comparison, but it's not a unique idea. Almost always, it's what is unique the flashes of brilliance that elevate standard FPS design into the Hall of Fame. Fear's reflex mode and AI, Titanfall's advanced movement, Doom's glory kill system. You'd be surprised, but the idea of making your enemies look like a Kraken's vagina to get at the juicy gamers ups inside is pretty much the only thing that makes Doom mechanically special. In many other games, defensive play either requires backing away from the fight, or blocking incoming damage, or dodging laterally. You're either stalling the action, or you're backing away entirely. In Doom, you have to perform a specific melee for health. So now where are you moving? Whatever your state may be, it's right towards an enemy. Unless you want to die, the stream of brutality can't either. This is the first half of the puzzle, and it's what Doom 2016 contributed to the world. But what Doom has always done is having movement be the key to reliably avoiding damage. That's the second half, but it's also not unique to Doom. Most aggressive FPS titles do the same. Titanfall is one of them. The difference is all in the enemy's projectiles. Where humans use conventional bullets which hit you before you can react to a visual cue, demons use much slower energy blasts. You can see these and react accordingly. 
surprisingly. Once, that might have made a functional difference, but in Eternal especially, there's so much shit going on that you can't keep track of every enemy projectile. You're still frantically moving, hoping for the best. No, the real difference is emotional. You don't have to do anything fancy to move out of the way. It creates a sense of inelegance, not a sense of agility, but of anger. Like the Slayer isn't moving that quickly because he's that skilled, but because he's that strong. The dash fits so well in Eternal, you barely even question that such a vital ability is new to the franchise. So understanding that reliably avoiding damage requires frantic movement, place that system in Eternal's complex arenas, saturate them with enemies, and what manifests is an unrelenting stream of interesting decisions in combat, far quicker than other games as incidental situations change. One second you're dumping your arsenal into a tyrant, but the next it attacks, so you dash into cover. You can no longer see the tyrant, but you can see another portion of the arena, and another group of enemies. The incidental situation has changed. The decisions you must make have changed. There's new opportunities for health, ammo, and armor. You need to assess the threat, you need to choose your weapon and strategy according to the enemies. Turn another corner, and it's something different. Portals and man cannons accelerate this process. Consider now the effect of immensely gratifying executions, of gore, of slow motion, of excellent movement control. And suddenly, the solution to all these problems, the answer to every decision, violence, contributes a primal sort of pleasure that cumulatively creates a stream of catharsis so potent it feels like adrenaline being injected directly into your heart. TLDR, excellent mechanics rapidly provide and enhance immensely satisfying catharsis. That's eternal, explained as concisely as I can. But I'd like to put a select few elements under the looking glass, because Eternal makes some interesting and quite controversial changes from its predecessor. The first is the simplest. Some enemies now have weak points, and if you break them, they become far less of a threat. I've seen this called strategy, but it isn't, it's just basic depth. It raises the skill ceiling by rewarding good aim and prioritization. Personally, I only see a point in this on the Mancubus, but it could be a cool skill worth mastering on a harder difficulty. The next one is a lot more controversial, Blood Punch. It's a devastating coned AoE, released by a version of your melee attack that charges up over time. But as cool as this is, it contributes no interesting decisions to the game. You're going to be pressing the melee button regardless. It's how you perform glory kills, which you will inevitably miss. Accidental melee is a foregone conclusion, so is melee just for the sake of it. And as a result of that, tactical Blood Punch isn't really reliable. That doesn't bring the game down at all. But I do worry that an attempt to encourage intelligent blood punch is the reason your standard melee hits like a gust of wind. I don't believe they'd do that. More likely, it was to increase depth. Fodder enemies are like health packs. They've got all the gamers ups. But in 2016, you could abuse melee to damage them enough, but not to kill, which is exactly where they need to be. In Eternal, however, you need smart, careful use of particular weapons to get just the right amount of bullying. That's a small increase in depth. Can't complain. But the ends did not justify the means. Eternal's punch makes Doomguy feel weak. Even I can punch harder than this and my arm looks like a pepper army. This is how I punch in my dreams. So in a game like Doom Eternal, the conflict is somewhat notable, you might say. You want the depth? Then weaken the melee, don't chemically castrate it. Perhaps it's a good thing for the prey to suit sentinels who I've punched into paralysis thanks to the button mapping, but I still completely agree with the criticism here. And that's nothing compared to this next one. This is the one that causes refunds. You you run out of ammo like Tesco's toilet paper supply. Your guns panic by the supply to make the demons die. The benefit is rapid weapon switching throughout every encounter. Do you work with one, move on to the other. It's subtle, but the effect is colossal. Every weapon changes your play one way or another. They all have different mods, and you're always using each one. See what that would do for the variation? Of course, it also massively increases the impetus to stock up on ammo, some of which is liberally scattered around the arenas, but most you'll get from the automatically refueling first charge for the chainsaw. Getting ammo creates tense situations that demand rapid movement, prioritization, aggression, and reward you with one of these messed up chainsaw kills. So it's genius, right? Uh, not according to the dissenters. Not since Sekiro have I seen such a get good sentiment within the player base, which is interesting because that's new for an FPS. Naturally, some people are playing with one lobe tied behind their back. You know the ones. The kind of people who'd lose a game of rock, paper, scissors with an actual pair of scissors. But for many others, it's simply personal preference to be able to reliably use their 
their favourite guns. I certainly don't think the system is without flaws. I hated the time I was stranded in a shooting puzzle with nothing to shoot. I hated that secret encounters had their difficulty entirely determined by how much ammo you enter them with. And until I maxed out my ammo upgrades, multiple weapons drawing from the same pool made me feel like I had to choose between one or the other. Want to use the ballista or the plasma rifle? Because early on, four ballista shots is pretty much everything you've got for the plasma rifle. If the goal was variation, this doesn't help. I think an ammo refresh near every secret encounter would have been wonderful with a rebalance. Otherwise, I see the disadvantages as the price we have to pay. I think it was worth it. And there's more. As well as that, Doom Eternal adds a consumable sword for targeted insta-kills, the flame belch to generate armor, and freeze grenades. This game's got enough mechanics to rip off half the world's pensioners, and some of the most consistent and consistently harsh challenge escalation I've ever seen, provided you pick the appropriate difficulty. Consider all that in combination with how fun the gameplay actually is, and you have your explanation for one of the most colossal skill gaps I've ever seen in a single-player FPS. It took almost the entire game for me to truly master all of its many mechanics. Grenades, armor, health, ammo, weapons, movement. And the difference between where I was at the start and where I was at the end is so vast it's hard to believe. Ten minutes in, a single spider demon could hand my ass to me. But 14 hours later, when I fought the dick-sniffing robots from the dawn of time, I cleaved through armies like some kind of war god. While getting my ass handed to me, it's all very smart. One effect of the skill gap is that it'll make speedruns even better viewing than 2016's were. I've heard a frame-perfect pegging session is the only way to please a speedrunner. Nightmare Marauders, I'm sure, will be happy to provide. Another effect is that it utterly wrecks the replay value. Unless you're bumping up the difficulty, who's gonna want to play earlier levels with half the mechanics? Thankfully, it'd have an answer for that. Master levels, vastly tougher remixes of specific missions meant to push you to the limit. There's not much to say, really. As answers go, that's as good as it gets. The final and most troublesome effect of the skill gap is the dreadful task of tutorializing all of it. The introduction of Eternal's mechanics are well paced out. Tutorials are clear, never excessive. I can't say they bring the experience down, but I can for the intro. The first 10 minutes of this game, excluding the cutscene, is possibly the least clean, most inelegant introduction to any game of this quality I have ever seen. Most of your key mechanics are just rolled out in this boring wooden tower one by one. There is zero intelligence behind it. 2016 had you break out of your own sarcophagus with the power of gamersups and pop a demon's head like a balloon within 10 seconds. Not genius, but artfully badass. Smart in its brutality. This is not smart. But it is short, even for a 15 hour campaign. So let's ask the question. How much shit is there on the menu and what fucking flavor is it? Doom Eternal's campaign is a thread of combat arenas and movement challenges interspersed with more static environments according to the narrative context, and secrets to reward exploration. A fairly standard setup, wouldn't you say? But this isn't a fairly standard campaign. They haven't done anything unique, they've simply brute forced the quality of its every aspect. You will experience interesting movement challenges, unique arenas, new enemies, new weapons, new concepts, new environments, and engaging narrative ideas at such a high density that it is scientifically impossible to grow bored of Doom Eternal. There is the mission where you blow up Mars. There is the mission where you blow up Hell. There is the mission where you blow up Heaven. And there's the mission where you blow up Hentai Tentacles. Okay, none of that's entirely true. But level design usually revolves around a similar core concept. Your path will be broken up by key cards or gore nests or portals or giant demon corpses you gotta demolish. It's remarkably engaging for a technique that contributes almost nothing mechanically. Progression is still linear nine times out of ten. But the world is made to feel more interesting, more living when there are perceived obstacles to overcome. And especially when that involves looping back round to places you've already been, armed with a new item or ability. Doom Eternal shows little regard for realism. Arenas are obviously arenas, created for play. And so they absolutely should be. This game is long for an FPS, and you go from fight to fight in minutes. It's the sheer number of high quality arenas that blows my fucking mind. Arena design is a complicated field. I explain it to a somewhat applicable degree in my Trepang video. How this game nails it so consistently, and incorporates unique concepts as a bonus, is beyond me. A unique arena may have a giant crusher you can use to your advantage, or a bunch of loot boxes that are all filled with either rewards or demons, or a big ass rotating flamethrower you have to match speed with. The best of all of these are the ones that don't have to give a second's thought to environmental context. The Slayer Gates, six of the toughest fights in the game. If you beat them all, you get the Unmaker, an angelic weapon of immense power. High effort for high reward. A fundamentally compelling idea, as games like Assassin's Creed have proved. 
I love it, but strangely, I died way the hell more in standard combat encounters. I believe the answer for why lies in the mind. You know this will be the fight of your life, you know you want that reward. So you focus up, you concentrate, and you unleash hell unto hell. You can actually see the screen shaking on my first gate because my hand was twitching so much. It's a remarkable thing, an encounter type that can get a reaction out of me every time. I haven't audibly shouted yes upon victory in a game for so, so long. But Doom had me doing it whenever it deemed it appropriate. I am in awe of this game. Doom will tell you when you should be speechless, and it'll never leave you starved for amazement. This is one of the best looking FPS games ever made. I'd argue for the number one spot. Did id just order a couple truckloads of artists? No. Well, probably. That or the art team was drinking gamer subs. But the effect of id Tech 7 cannot be understated. The tools themselves have been upgraded so massively that artists have freedom they simply never had before. Real-time editing of decals on the geometry. Excellent blending of one layer of detail with another. Easier asset editing, but also the move away from Doom 2016's mega texture all have a noticeable effect. You can wave goodbye to an 80 gigabyte download, over-compress textures and pop in, and say hello to the incredible difference these decals make. A more subtle benefit of id Tech 7 is the way Doom Eternal loads so fast on a hard drive, I'd swear they actually did sell their souls to the devil. It's the fastest I have ever seen a game this graphically complex load, ever. It's number one, and there is no competition. The effect is of course enormous. New levels load with half the downtime of 2016, and death is far less frustrating because you barely have to wait 10 seconds. It is the experience of an SSD on a hard drive. Can you imagine what it's like on an actual SSD? Probably finishes before you've even bought the game. The only technical issues I had throughout the entire game was a repeating sound effect and a crash. It was a really strange crash though, the game didn't freeze up or anything. It just disappeared in front of my eyes, which had me writing my control inputs in the script. Id Tech 7 is so polished even the crashes are clean, and we haven't even gotten to the good bit yet. What blew me away most wasn't the environments or the weapon models, it wasn't even the loading. It was the fact that it's worse than Doom 2016. Okay, that's not entirely true. To be honest, it's only 0.1% true, but it's an important 0.1%. Most of these are an obvious improvement, but what in the fuck have they done to the Revenant? And where's the Cybermancubus' Oculus Rift? The imp looks more like a shaved cat than a demon. The pinky looks pink, which sounds smart, but it's not, and the standard Mancubus is still visible from Google Earth, and has a face like a plug socket imprinted into a Belgian blues ass cheek. But what the fuck? If this was the price to pay for the incredible new dynamic gore system that lets you shoot bits off your enemies in battle, then fine, it's worth it. But if not, then what the fuck? This game has extensive movement challenges. What the fuck? Nobody expected that transition in the same way nobody expected this. You extend airtime with monkey bars, you time dashes in midair to fly large distances, and you leap off climbable surfaces. These core mechanics are refined perfectly. You can feel Doomguy's weight as he slams into walls. Timing challenges and various additional mechanics are layered on top as the game goes on. They can get pretty difficult. Never so easy that they're pointless or so hard that they're frustrating. They're fun. It's good to have some much needed variation in the gameplay, but having said that, I never felt like they fit. This was hardly a bother in my case, but others just can't get over it in more ways than one. Why on earth would people not want more mechanics? Who would want less game? That's a tough question, but by no means are you wrong to feel that way. If you stick something foreign to the franchise's identity in the sequel, the fundamental feeling of it can change, like nuts and bolts, and depending on who you are, that could matter a lot. There's no good reason to stop a series from evolving, and there is nothing wrong with the idea of advanced movement, but there must have been a more Doom-like way of designing that. As well as it works, they could have done this smarter. Eternal is a wild, entirely unrestricted game. It does what it wants, and that's inevitably going to ruffle feathers. The increased focus on narrative is yet another example, but this is far more interesting than monkey bars. First question, it's Doom, who gives a shit about the story? Answer, me. I thought it was great, mainly because I read the lore and that's also an interesting concept. Just one that's hard to adjust to. Doom Eternal initially feels as if it isn't connected to 2016 at all. In the span of a single mission, any preconceptions you might have from the first game are entirely discarded. This isn't a religious twist on sci-fi anymore. It's an expansive universe of alien worlds, with kings and kingdoms and spirits and essences, and Khan makers with their legions of robot angels. I thought the bad guy was meant to be Tom Ellis and Bob Page, not a Halo 5 guardian. Why does the Khan maker want to consume the child and corrupt them all? Who is this Council of LARPing method? 
both heads. You're not going to have a chance in Hell, Earth, or Heaven of understanding it without scouring the Codex and making it much further into the campaign. The Slayer understands, but you don't. Which is a shame, because understanding enhanced everything. As I learned the lore, Vega glitching in Erdak, Hayden's ambition and his slight resentment towards you. These subtleties carry meaning when you understand the workings of the world they are in. Knowing why we're meant to decapitate the Chuckle Brothers makes the execution that much more satisfying. Now let me talk to you about Sentinel Prime. Complete prick, still haven't gotten over Ironhide. Wait, no. Oh yeah, Sentinel Prime, the level, yeah, okay. As good as the lore is, and as entertaining as the story is, the disconnect between the two is enforced by the fact that Doom is Doom. Sentinel Prime is a story mission, until the boss, you interact with the Khan Maker and watch some cutscenes. That could describe much of this game's story. The lore provides much needed enhancement. But look here how it's disconnected. There's about 10 codex entries scattered throughout the mission path. It felt crude and stupid to follow a breadcrumb trail of text boxes. It's ridiculous, this is Doom. But then again, this is Doom. If the lore were delivered by any means other than optional text or audio, then those who just want to shoot demons would likely have to subject themselves to it, like everyone else. Delivering lore in a Doom game has to be done carefully. In this mission, they clearly couldn't manage it. Having less lore isn't worth a sacrifice. No, the best band-aid solution to this is more voice, less text. I must assume Id knew that. Could be they ran out of time. Or Samuel Hayden's voice actor was charging a hundred bucks per word. The narrative made this a better game, but there's plenty of room to improve the delivery for the next one. We aren't done with Sentinel Prime yet. It's got another crime to answer for. To compensate for the lower pace of the level, you're thrown into a Colosseum with the Gladiator, and its first phase is weak as shit. You can only do damage when his traffic light shield says so. You can only do damage in the same way, and it takes an age to finish. It's probably the most boring encounter in the entire game. Which is weird, because the second phase is fantastic. Aggression, unique attacks, there's even a skipping rope you gotta jump over. Now that's badass. The rest of the boss fights in Eternal are the kind of moments I'd rather not spoil mechanically, even in a spoiler review, but know that I loved all of them, and that the Gladiator isn't the only weak point in this campaign. These blunders I will cover. You spend the entire arc mission forging a path through demonic hordes, all to reach Dr. Samuel Hayden's office. His return is kinda hyped up, but upon your grand reunion, he just reads out your next destination. That's it. You might say these characters sort of have a history. There's a bit of unresolved tension. Uh, wh what happened? It feels like a page from the script was torn out. Another inexplicable missed opportunity wasn't long after, when the Doom Fortress is overrun by demon escapees. Your home is the arena and BFG division is blaring in the background. Enjoy, for all 15 seconds of it, because these 10 or so demons are all there is. What was the point in that? Why even bother with a concept? 10 demons? What game am I playing? I asked the same question when Taras Nabad had me, get this, swimming. Yeah, they uh, they put swimming in Doom. It isn't obnoxious for the same reason most water levels are, but mechanically there is absolutely nothing to it. It's ironically shallow, completely out of place, and so pointless, I feel like I'm dreaming. This is parallel universe shit. Sometimes I feel like they designed this game with a dartboard. The prey to suit points are boring, the sentinel crystals are poorly explained and the UI sucks. I also think King Novik sounds like he's speaking into a toilet bowl during the closing monologue. The sword. You remain unbroken. But that is pretty much it. Uh oh, that wasn't it guys. There's just one more niggling little problem. It seems that just about everyone agrees. The Marauder. They all want to fuck him. Wait. No. They all want him to fuck off. I concur, but it's not that simple. Fundamentally, the Marauder functions as a boss-type enemy, which is why he is literally a boss and always alone thereafter. He is invincible. He is also in extreme danger. To deal with that, you're taught to bait out a counter window, marked by green eyes and triggered by standing in mid-range. Too close, he'll use a shotgun. Too far, he'll throw energy blades. The effect of that is restriction. There's one way almost everyone will use to beat the Marauder. Red light, green light. His invincibility forces one or two standardized strategies. Other enemies can't change anything because they aren't there and the arena does nothing for variation because you pretty much have to fight him on the same plane. The Marauder lacks on-the-fly interesting decisions presented by standard combat. That's why I don't think he should have recurred more than twice. On those occasions, a fresh combat experience. Afterwards, more like a nuisance. An effect far worsened by this enemy's inconsistency. Too far, too close, these never feel like concrete distances. And it'd help if the AI didn't make me sit still for random amounts of time as it decides when to attack. Inconsistency
inconsistency leads to frustration. That's strike two. If you've been online recently, you might have heard Doom Eternal is amazing. But the Marauder though. Yes, this game has its lows, but that doesn't change my conclusion. Doom Eternal is one of the best FPS games ever made. It is a technical marvel, a visual feast, and as privy to glorious execution as the Doom Slayer is. The game can be likened to an adrenaline pump, feeding catharsis into your eyes, your heart, your hands. Its effect is like nothing I've ever seen, and for that I'm confident placing it in my top 50 of all time. I do not consider Masterpiece a synonym for perfect, only because there is no grammatical bullshit that could stop me from believing this game to be one, despite its many flaws. If you haven't played this game, stop not playing it, and thank you for watching. And if you haven't got a website, stop not using Squarespace. Very few things in Doom are square, apart from Vega's brain of course, because he still hasn't figured out how easy it'd be to get everything organised with a website. If I can set up my online presence in an hour, unassisted, a super-powered AI can do it too. Ever wanted to rule a domain? By which I mean, have your own website link? Well now you can, straight from the same place you designed it. And when you're done with that, provided you've had your morning coffee, give useful feedback to your minions with the integrated commenting features. A demon writes a comment, suppose, you can precisely explain the error of their ways. And joke about their choice of device, because with Squarespace's traffic overview, you'll understand long-term visitation trends, which operating system they use, browsers, you'll even get insight into the top traffic sources to, uh, plan your next expedition. And while you're away, you can keep uploading your posts by scheduling them before you leave. That's probably useful for normal people too. If you'd like to help support the channel, and rule the multiverse, stop cutting 10% off demons for a moment so you can instead cut 10% off your first Squarespace purchase with my special link and offer code WHITELIGHT.